Selamat malam teman-teman semua. Halo Mbak Syafa. Ini Pak Mahasin juga sudah ada ya. Halo Mbak, selamat sore. Selamat eh, sore. Ma- sore. <laughs> selamat malam. Ini emangnya kita anu ya beda waktu ya. <laughs> Ini beda waktu jadi nanti good good evening, good afternoon dan juga good morning gitu ya. <laughs> Kalau iya. yang di Amerika kan masih pagi sekali nih Mbak di Sono. Pagi. Kalau ya New York kan Masa satu jam. Washington ya, DC kalau di sini kita jam 7, di sana jam 8 ya, 8 pagi ya. Iya, udah bangunlah mereka tuh. Iya, iya, ya sudah bangunlah. Baru minum-minum kopi kayaknya. <laughs> sehat toh, Mbak? Halo. Ya? Sehat toh? Sehat, sehat. Terima kasih. Ya. Kita itu agak gemuk ya. Nah itu dia. Kenapa Udah... makan makan Kenapa? lagi sekarang tidak diet tidak kayak biasanya lagi? Wah ini satu bulan lebih ini nggak berani keluar. Oh ya? Nggak berani aku, jalan aku. Aku keluar jalan itu jalan pagi biasa ritual pagi jam 8 ya, gitu. Di, di kampungku sini banyak ini yang sedang isoman positif. Oh Gak ya, berani. tetangga hmm. itu kemarin beberapa hari itu saya sehari setelah dia meninggal saya nggak jalan karena itu habis meninggal tuh dia <laughs> lagi hamil mbak lagi hamil empat Aduh, bulan masih, masih muda. Kalau Terus di kantor dia... sejak kita udah enam minggu nggak masuk kantor udah tutup. dari rumah semua tutup hmm. karena di Banteng situ kan merah. Oh ya. Tapi tadi ya tadi pagi saya kontak Pak Kadus. nanya sudah membaik hmm. walaupun masih ada juga yang terpapar terpapar isoman hmm. tapi yang isoman itu diobatin nggak sih mbak di asal beritahu di rt diurus dikasih oh. vitamin di kalau kita di kampung sini kita kumpul duit untuk e, makanan mereka ya kalau apalagi kalau sekeluarga sekeluarga itu, itu dianterin kan... gitu atau gimana Iya ada yang tukang masak di diantarin taruh di depan pintu pokoknya diatur deh. Oh gitu. Juga vitamin eh, semua diurus. Lokal hmm. emang kalau jalan keluar nggak boleh? Boleh kalau aku lagi... keluar aja cuma nggak <laughs> berani jauh-jauh. Ya kan cuma keliling cari matahari gitu soalnya kalau oh, iya. bergerak tuh juga malah pegal-pegal ya badan tuh. Olahraga ini rumahku kan dari ujung kiri barat timur matahari masuk keluar nih. Jadi tiap pagi olahraga sih, cuman jalan pagi jauh-jauh seperti biasa nggak nggak berani. Ya aku nggak jauh-jauh sih, paling keliling pondok situ atau ke depan sono gitu. Oh ya. Tapi pakai masker double gitu sekarang. Oh ya, ya. Ngeri. Ini Pak Mahasin sudah ada nih. Pak Mahasin, selamat malam. Ya, selamat Bang malam. Erik, selamat bagus. Malam, harus. Sehat ya Pak Mahasin. Alhamdulillah. Cuma ini persis orang yang rumahnya satu nomor dengan saya, ada tiga, <laughs> ada tiga orang yang kena. Oh iya. Pak Mahasin, <laughs> daerah mana ini Pak Mahasin? Saya di, di, UIN. di UIN itu ya? Iya. Di belakang, di sebelah selatan. Di, 
di dekat situ ya. <laughs> oh, di situ banyak yang kena. Di mana, Pak Mazin? Ya, itu persis. Jadi, cuma selang dua rumah dari rumah saya. Nomornya, oh. dia, saya 522B, dia 522 saja. <laughs> Tapi itu. isolasi mandiri atau di rumah sakit? Masih di, di rumah. Di rumah. Hmm. Kan, itu kan ada istilahnya berapa persen. Kalau kalau terpaparnya itu kurang dari 30 persen, itu kan tidak diapa-apakan, cuma istirahat. Iya. Yeah. Dan makan suplemen kan? Ya. Kalau kalau 30 sampai 70 itu baru yang diisolasi betul-betul oh, tidak okay. boleh, kan? tidak boleh ketemu apa orang lain gitu. Oh, Kecuali yeah. pakaian yang nanti kalau lebih dari 70 persen itu harus di rumah sakit. Ya, karena ada ada yeah. begitu. Ini udah banyak anu ini tempat-tempat isoman puskat semua dipakai termasuk yang bunga lembu yang baru semua dipakai. Oh ya. Uin, Uin kan juga kan? dipakai di tengah. Di tengah Uin tengah dipakai, ya. UGM dipakai. Tapi Uin dipakai untuk apa anu, Pak? Pak Masin untuk isolasi. Iya, yang di mana? Ya, itu di dalam kampus yang apa? Misalnya apa guest house? Oke, okay, sos yang di situ yang di belakang itu iya. di bandara. Bukan Atau di dalam, oh, di dalam. Kan? Di dalam kampus. Oh, yang Asalnya. di belakang masjid itu ya untuk tamu-tamu ya. itu ya. ya. Wah. Oh, guys, sos itu. Oh. Saya ketemu Amina Wadud di situ yang tempatnya Amina dulu ya. Iya, iya, iya. Yang tamu-tamu itu kan. Oke. Okay. Ini Pak Kais ada. Selamat malam Pak Kais. Lama tak jumpa ini. Pak ya? Ya, ya. Helga. Ya. Ibu Safa ini nggak kenal lagi sama saya ya. Aku tuh tadi mikir-mikir itu Erik Barus, Erik Barus itu yang dulu itu Emangnya? Ya? Iya, Emangnya masih ganteng, Barus? masih ganteng. Oh, masih Kamu ganteng masih, ya. Masih cantik ya. Kamu oh, juga masih gitu cantik. Ya. Iya. Gimana ini Erik Barus sekarang nih? Ya aku di Medan ini, biasalah. Oh, Kau Medan, Mbak. Kau iya. kalau mau ke Medan harus lapor nih. Saya lapor sama Ketua RT. <laughs> ini tadi aku kuliah baru so, sama ini. Kok muda aja? Hah? Oh, iya. Kayaknya makin muda aja. Enggak lah, oh, udah. Udah 61 aku. Roberto, halo. Good morning. Eh, I don't know. In Italy. Roberto. Siang. Boleh izin mohon izin mulai uh, mic, mic-nya Pak Roberto? Uh, mana wajahnya Safa asli ini nggak 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 aku tengok ini cuma masalah. Roberto your your voice ada ini soalnya di tempat aku not... internetnya itu unstable tulisannya selalu muncul begitu jadi daripada uh, video nanti nggak jelas suaranya mendingan suara aja. Iyalah. Kita mau dokter Pui dan ya dokter Pui thank you for coming. Oh, yes. Hi. Hello. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. You you see Professor Mahasin there? Yeah, Dr. Pui. We, we yeah, share yeah. the same house in in my mirror, no? <laughs> yeah. And uh, I I couldn't remember the name of the, the house. It's Dominican Dominican. Oh. When was it? Oh, like 10 years ago. Oh. <laughs> Ya. Tidak mohon izin memulai ya. Silakan, silakan. Ya. Oke, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan, Rahayu, Namaste, Greeting of Peace, Alhamdulillahirobbilalamin, Hamdan wa syukronillahi amma ba'du. Uh, my beloved uh, brother and sister in peace, friends of Intervie Day, thank you so much uh, for your participation in this meeting. My name is Ida, staff in Intervie Day. Uh, I and Dian, my friend from Kupang, from East uh, Nusa Tenggara Women Network. Hello, Kak Dian. We'll be... Uh, Master of Ceremony or host in this meeting, yeah. Kadian, are you there? I'm here. Thank you, Kaida. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is the fourth webinar uh, on 
our 30th anniversary uh, of in Institute Dian Intervide. Our theme tonight is sharing experience and reflection with friends of Intervide in the international network. What are some valuable lessons in facing and responding to the prison leading to a shared positive feature for peace in the world. Uh, I would like to announce some technic, uh, technical yeah, uh, rules through this webinar. First, uh, please mute your microphone so we can get clear voices from the speakers and moderator tonight. Second, if you are need in donation and English translation, please uh, or click the globe on your screen or your phone and choose your language. Here we have a friend who will be uh, interpreters here. Uh, Ka Icha, Ka Anggita, and Ka Herman, and Ka Lucy. Can you guys uh, open your camera and dada? for our audience, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then the third, uh, if you have any ideas or questions, please write into the chat room. Uh, so uh, that's all of our technical rules. If you have any question, please uh, yeah, write down in the chat room. So for the next session, I pass to Kak Dian Pasdon, please. Thank you, Kaida. Good evening, good morning, good day, good afternoon to all of you. It's such an honor to be in one screen with all, all of you. Uh, my brothers and sisters in peace, we have all seen the changes in the global political map that have an effect on the dynamics of human life in all parts of the world, from the way we think our conscience, attitudes, and behaviors towards life with our fellow humans and our place in the universe to the lifestyle of all generations. Everything has undergone many changes, some tending to be destructive, inhuman, violent, unfriendly to nature, and even deadly. However, everywhere we can still see, hear, read, and follow the people citizens, individuals and groups, government allies, public leaders of society, including religious leaders, academic in the education sphere, the critical, the aware, those with hope and optimism and the sincere, honest and just, who continually work actively, tireless and strive for the good of cooking life together with other human beings, regardless of differences and the universe. We are grateful that the experiences during the pandemic also have also given meaningful lessons to all of us of how important it is to live in peace with simplicity and sincerity, with honesty of thoughts, conscience, and behavior for peace in our countries and to the world to be as one, as, as a one home. In this fourth webinar series, which is the last of the webinar series held for the 30th anniversary of Intervide, which falls on the 10th of August, 2021, we invite you, friends and acquaintances of the Institute to attend the event and listen to the experiences and reflections from friends of the Intervide International Network about what are valuable lessons in facing and living in the present for a positive future for the benefit of a life together in peace? So the sharing experiences and reflection will be in the talk show and our moderator for tonight is Professor Syafa Alton Al Mirsana, PhD, the Min, the Professor of Religious Studies at Sunan Kalijaga State Islamic University in Yogyakarta, Indonesia. Uh, beforehand, uh, I, I will apologize if 
misspelling in your name or title. And uh, my brothers and sisters, before we go to the talk show, of course, we have to open and close it properly. So I will give a quick picture what will be the agendas of tonight's session. So we will start first with an, with, uh, an opening prayer, and then we will sing the national anthem of Indonesia. And there will be an opening remark from friends from uh, interview day and the talk show and uh, some closing statement and also a closing remark. So I invite you all to first, let's pre prepare ourselves. We will be in a silent moment and the opening prayer will be led by Kaka Fira Fitri Fitria, the founder of Tuban Disability Organization and the coach of Indonesian Disability Home. Uh, please, Kak Fira, the floor is, your, is yours. Mohon oh, maaf, Mbak. Ini masih ada. Sebentar lagi bagaimana? Oh, oke. Okay. Um, how, how much time we need to wait? Like five minutes or... Iya, di oh, sini uh, rumah saya dekat uh, masjid musola, jadi nanti kalau doa takutnya enggak apa kurang jelas suaranya masih ada, tapi ini udah ikomat. Oke. Okay. So I will ask my friend, Kak Ida, is it better to start with the national anthem first and yeah. then the prayer? Oke. Okay. Okay. Yes, okay, Katia. Okay, okay, Ka Kafira. Then we start first with the national anthem, and then we we go back to the prayer. Yeah, is that okay? Okay, okay. Kak. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, my brothers and sisters in peace, we are all invited to sing the national anthem in Indonesia Raya, but. For those who want to sing, can also be in an, a silent moment. So for us, maybe for uh, Indonesians participants, I request we all to stand in honor of national anthem. Kaida, please.
Untuk lama lamanya hilang suara. Uh, Kak Ida, are we finish? Okay, maybe it's a technical uh, problem. Okay, then uh, thank you all and please be seated. Okay, and now, Okay, um, there is a technical problem with uh, Kaide's laptop, so uh, we will uh, continue to the next session. It's, uh, it is an opening prayer. So, Kak Fitri, Kak Fira Fitri, are you there? Yes. yes. Okay. So, please, please, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, dear Allah, the mighty, please let us carry talk this. Recognable even today. Please be said, use with good and positive thing for our future. <laughs> We hope that our disability brother and sister Bear we talk this to situation and we hope that this pandemic will be over soon. Amin. Thank you. Amin. Amin. Thank you, Kak Fira. Thank you for the prayer to give us energy and spirit for the session tonight and uh, before we go to the talk show I invite you all to let's uh, give an opening remark that will be spoken by Kiai Haji Professor Dr. Ha Makasin the chair of Intervide. Professor Magasin, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> um, good evening, good uh, morning. Um, Hello. I, um, I see many faces uh, that I couldn't, I couldn't know uh, where, where you are. So uh, I will say that uh, I, I pray to God that uh, he bless you all. Uh, it is uh, a gift for us in day to have you here in this uh, screen, in this Zoom meeting uh, to talk about religion. Sometimes uh, we uh, face um, things uh, uh, that lead us to Uh, unhappiness with religion. For example, with this uh, pandemic uh, situation, 
some people use religion as a uh, uh, hindrance to help masses or uh, they refuse to do uh, what is uh, supposed to do by uh, by the uh, physician by the uh, expert of health uh, they they will say that uh, that uh, virus is the creature of god so um, and uh, if uh, the virus kill us it is the will of god so we uh, don't have to uh, do anything to protect ourselves from this virus because god will protect us it's uh, this uh, things and many others remind me to uh, the uh, the two aspects of religion it is uh, the um, enlightening one but also the uh, what's it uh, the, the aspect that makes uh, that uh, that uh, make people do knife uh, action uh, so they they seem to be anti knowledge with the fatalistic faith uh, brought from religion so it is our task to to, uh, to uh, know better what the religion or the the people of religion should do in face of this pandemic and many other uh, many other uh, and will situation uh, facing our life so uh, i will say that uh, thank you to you all to be with us to talk about uh, religion and uh, being religious for peace how can we uh, observe religious teaching in a healthy manner with respect and love uh, to one another and be uh, in solidarity with those who are not able to um, even to understand the religion and the, the function of religion in uh, facing our bad situation but uh, in uh, because i i uh, believe that religion can give hope also uh, with uh, the belief in God, we may uh, stand in front of many difficulties. So once again, thank you for participation, for your participation in this uh, meeting, in this uh, seminar. And I hope that uh, we will have uh, good points that we may uh, implement in the, in the future. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you, Prof, for the uh, remarkable speech. And I, I want to share one thing or one sentence that I heard from my friend. She said that when we share uh, knowledge, we share power. Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, I, I want to, I would like to ask everyone who who is joining this uh, webinar to, tonight to use this precious time. Let's, uh, we learn from each other through the talk show. And here I present to you, Professor Shafatun Almirsana to be our moderator for the talk show. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. Because people are everywhere, so maybe we have different time. Ladies and gentlemen, hope you are all safe and healthy. I am Shafal Mirzana. Mayelka asked me to be a moderator for this conversation. But before beginning our conversation with our speakers, let me say a couple words. Plurality is a fact of our contemporary world, both on a global scale and often on the level of specific societies. 
Throughout most of recorded history, humanity has experienced a rich plurality of religion. This is due to the manifoldness of the divine revelation and of it human pursuit in different cultures. So Pope John Paul II says, religion are many and varied and they reflect the desire of men and women throughout the ages to enter into relationship with the absolute being. In this, the Pope echoed the teaching of Nostra Aetate that the Catholic Church reject nothing that is true and holy in the other religion of the world. The contemporary globalizing context of religious pluralism is unlike any of have so many different religious communities and individuals existed in such close proximity to and even interdependent on one another. Indeed, a polycentric world which is being born ever closer together by new communication technologies, said Hans Kung. At the same time, it must be a transcultural and multi-religious world. There also seem to be an increasing curiosity about other religion, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, as a phenomenon of reading each other's scripture and reading about each other's religion seems to grow more popular. Those of us who engage in interreligious inquiry are variously inspired, perplexed, and in some cases even repulsed by what we surmise as each other's insight and practices. This is why we uh, tonight we need to to uh, what is share our experience about this. Optimally speaking, we find that our various traditions share the same fundament, same fundamental values that each of us cherish in our own religion, albeit expressed in different ways. We also, being we also realize that we are being challenged to articulate our own religious identities in an increasingly religiously plural setting where others are in many ways listening and asking questions of us as we do so. What this means is that whether we like it or not, to be religious today is to be interreligious. For someone who is uh, coming from religious studies, I think knows very well the dictum from Frederick Max Miller. He who knows one religion knows none, perhaps largely referring in his own scholarly context to those who aspire to become expert in the study of a particular religious tradition. But today, this dictum seems to have significant well beyond the membership of American Academy of Religion and similar scholarly societies. In today's increasingly religiously plural social context, this would suggest that not only that a value to engage pluralism is an act of self-marginalization within our own social context. They also suggest that without some understanding of our faith, of the faith of our neighbor, the religious person or religious community living in a religiously plural society cannot even understand oneself. Indonesia, professor who is coming from outside Indonesia, Indonesia is both the largest archipelago and biggest Muslim country in the world. It is also probably one of the most ethnically and culturally heterogeneous of the world religious nation. In the past, Indonesia with its diverse ethnic and religion was seen as a model for tolerant country. However, in the last 18 years or so, the international media and some academic have one of the rising Islamic radicalism and intolerance in Indonesia. As Bob Hefner said, one celebrated in the Western media as a shining example of liberal and tolerant Islam, Indonesia since the Anno Suharto regime had witnessed a variety of development that bespeak a conservative turn in the country's Muslim politics. Whether this later development represent a shift in the character of Indonesian Islam toward fundamentalism is a subject of debate. You can say that, but what is not debatable is that in the last few years, the more conservative and radical expression of Islam are prevalent in the country, which is undoubtedly setback for religious pluralism. Ladies and gentlemen, whether we are religious or not, understanding religion actually is a key to understand other culture. Religion has been powerful forces throughout history in any country, sometimes working for good and sometimes to destroy. They have inspired some of the greatest and nobles act and equally they have also inspired some of the most ruthless brutality. They are central to much social and political history. 
as Hans Kung always mentioned of what he called the global change of consciousness, which is vital for our survival, that no peace among nations without peace among religions, no peace among religions without dialogue between religion, and no dialogue between religion without investigating a foundation of religion. He also said capacity for dialogue is capacity for peace. We are not living in a secularist world. The word today is for family religious as it ever was, and maybe in some places more so ever than, more so than ever. So to contribute fully to the politic of nation or affair of the world, we need to foster our community, community's basic knowledge about the world religion. Ladies and gentlemen, now let me introduce our distinguished speakers. Could you please raise your hand when I call your name? Thank you. First, uh, Ibu Josin Slob Forward. Ibu Josin, are you there? Uh, she is an introvert worker in the Netherlands and her uh, organization, I think is very well known in Salatiga with uh, called Perchik. The second yes, one, yes. Nicola Adam. He's a, Nicola Adam, are you there? Oh, Ibu, Ibu Josin is there, okay. Nicola Adam, are you there? I'm here, hello. Okay, welcome. Uh, Nicola Adam, you are professor of philosophical theology in the University of Birmingham, England, right? Welcome, thank you for coming. The third one, Roberto Catalano. Roberto, are you there? Yes. Okay. Nice to meet you Thank all. you. Nice, nice to meet to you too. Here. Thank you. Uh, yeah, he is a co-director of International Office for Interreligious Dialogue of the Focolare Movement in Rome, Italy. Oh, Focolare. Okay. The fourth one is Sumanto Al Kurtubi. Pak Sumanto, are you there? Hello, Ma. Yes. Okay, Pak Sumanto, he's Indonesian, but he's a professor of anthropology in King Fahd University of Petroleum and Mineral, Saudi Arabia. Welcome, Pak Sumanto. Okay, Ma. Thank uh, you so much. Fourth one, uh, Pilbert Aganyo. Pak Pilbert, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you okay. so much. It's a pleasure Thank being you, here. Pilbert. Thank, Thank you. you. Wilbert Agagno, he's chairperson of Kenya Interfaith Laws Network, Nairobi. Yeah, you're still young, right? Okay, the sixth one is uh, my, what is it? My old friend, Jehuda Stolov. Are you there, Jehuda? Yehuda is an executive director of Interfaith Encounter Association, Jerusalem, Israel. Yehuda, are you there? Not yet, maybe. No, your microphone says. I am here, but uh, I had troubles getting out of mute. Oh, hi, Yehuda. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good to see you. Okay, no, thank you. The second one is Ibu Nelly van Don Harder. Ibu Nelly, are you there? She is a professor at the Center of Islamic Theology for a University of Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and also a professor at the Department for the study of religion, Wake Forest University, Salem, United States. I was there. So I met her uh, two, two years ago, I think. Ibu Nelly, are you there? Your Maybe not. Okay. I am sorry, I was on, uh, I said, Slamet oh. Pagis. I'm here, sorry. Uh, Selamat malam, Ibu Nelly. How are you? I am very well, thank you. Okay, good, thank you. Um, and then... Ibu Nelly, next... aku muridnya. Eric Barus, dari Medan. Yeah, she is also my professor. Okay, okay. The next one, Professor Dr. Azek Karam. Are you, are you there? I am here and honored and delighted to be so. Thank oh, you so much. Oh, thank you, Professor Azza Karam. She is the Secretary General of Religion for Peace International, New York, United States. And the last but not least, Reverend, my best friend, Elha Sarapung. Hello. Selamat Hello. malam. Selamat malam, Ibu Elga. She's the director of our um, organization, Dian Institute, Interfide Yogyakarta, Indonesia. Thank you. So as, as a moderator, I was asked that each of you, each of speaker can, one, 
could you please share experiences and thought of what has been done related to the issue on an interface dialogue in each country, in, 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 in your country and other countries? And the second one, what and how is the relationship between what you have done to what our organization, in this case, Interfide, and it next what has done? So is there any relationship uh, uh, with our uh, organization, what we have done? And the last one, what is the significance of building, empowering, and developing international interface network? So is there any significant that we need to build and empower and also develop international interfaith network? I think that uh, three, what is that aspect that we need uh, you to share with us, okay? So now the first one, Ibu Josin Slop. Um, each of you maximum, uh, we give seven minutes so Ibu Josin, you are very active in building interfaith understanding both in your country and in Indonesia, of course, with your organization called Project in Solotiga. So Ibu, Ibu Josin, could you please share with us your experience? So the time is yours, Ibu, Ibu Josin. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Shafan. Well, I would like to start with the second question, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, but but first of all, I um, yeah, would say many congratulations for the uh, 30th anniversary of Interfi Day. And it's really a big effort to hold on through many sometimes hard times and complicated developments in your country, but also in other countries. And I would like to begin with our relations with some people in Interfi Day. It was at the end of the 70s, of the last century, Jasper, my late husband, and I stayed and worked in Tomohon, North Sulawesi. And Jasper was a pastor working in lay training for church member. And he was a teacher at uh, the theological faculty, uh, Ukit. And one of his students, so in 76, was Elga Sarapung. Oh. So, so we know Elga more than 45 years. It's unbelievable. But living in Indonesia after almost seven years in North Sulawesi, the country, Indonesia, it's the country with the biggest number of Muslims. We didn't have experiences with encounter between Muslims and Christians because the Minahasa was for more than 50% uh, region of Christians. Well, in 1983, we went back to the Netherlands and maybe one or two years later, Sumatono arrived in Amsterdam to do his master and his PhD thesis. He and his wife Retno became very good friends. In 1988, I became a chaplain to international students. In Leiden and Delft were at that time many Indonesian students. And one of them was pa Mahasin, the yes. moderator now of Interview Day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was Sumatono who supported and inspired me to organize meetings, especially for Indonesian students, Muslims and Christians. As Indonesians, we can talk here very freely said Sumatono. It is a unique chance to meet each other and talk with each other. Because at that time in Indonesia, it was quite difficult. So it was Sumatono's dream. And once a month, we gathered together with, well, sometimes 20 till 30 people in our house. The topics we talked about varied, about social and economic religious issue in Indonesia. What I most learned from Sumatono was his relaxed attitude. Before we start, started discussing, well, we have to eat first, of course, an Indonesian way of life. And I learned cooking Indonesian in a better way. And I must say it really helped to create an open atmosphere and to build trust in a natural way. So, 
Well, with a smile, actually you can say that the embryo of Intervide laid in the Netherlands. For Sumatono, it was a tryout, an exercise in encounter. Several times before leaving the Netherlands, Sumatono discussed with diff different people about building an institute for dialogue. How to do that? On what condition? Should it be related to religious institutions, to church and Muslim uh, institutions, to political? Well, we know the result. Intervide is an independent institute with good relations to universities and churches, Muslim organizations, governmental organizations, and with a big net network, national and international. The mission board of the Dutch Reformed Church and ECO supported this new idea of Sumatono, but also Professor Anthony Wessels, who was his promoter and his soulmate. Now I'd like to go to the situation in the Netherlands for a moment, because one person who was also inspired by Sumatono was the late Jan Post Hospice. He and his wife Tereini stayed in Salatika and Yogyakarta for many years. From 2006 on, Jan worked in a Protestant church in the Netherlands, especially for the interreligious inter relations. Together with Jewish people, Moroccan and Turkish Muslims, and with Christians, together they build up a network. And this network or platform uh, was called Believe in Living Together. And they support local initiatives, how to build bridges between people of different religious and ethnic backgrounds. They also train people, for instance, to deal with problems in deprived neighborhoods, poverty, loneliness. They guide people, they advise the city government. And one of the examples is uh, in one of the cities here in the Netherlands, there are continuous demonstrations against building a mosque. Well, how do you handle demonstrations like these? But they also supported women meetings on local and national level. Cooperation, for instance, between green mosques and green churches. They emphasize and stimulate local cooperation on recent social issues to handle them practical and concrete. So religion has also very much to do with concrete life and political life. Believe in Living Together organized also discussions about Article 1 of our law, about freedom of speech, of religions, etc. And they talk especially with asylum seekers, refugees, so that they also know more about freedom of speech and religion in our country. So it's important to say that the starting point of Believe in Living Together is how to strengthen the good in each other and how to see that we all are equal. I hope we can inspire each other for many years more to strengthen the good in each other and to see each other as equals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ibu Josin. Okay, that's inspiring. That's remind me of a uh, Pak Sumartana. Yeah. Thank you, Ibu Josin. Okay, so, welcome. Next, uh, Professor Nicola Adam, Professor of, of Philosophy and Theology from Birmingham. So the time is yours, Professor. Thank you. Salamat malam. Uh, Salamat can you hear me? Oh, you speak Indonesia? <laughs> Belum. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a great pleasure. Uh, and it's a privilege to be part of Interfidi's 30th birthday. It's a landmark for Jogja, it's a landmark for Indonesia, and for networks all across the world. The work of Interfidi is inspiring. It's also astonishingly varied, 
And as a foreigner, I am aware that I know only a small part of your varied work. Your public events, of course, are internationally visible and transformative, but behind this visible exterior, all kinds of complex negotiations are at work. This work is political, diplomatic, educational. It's national and local. It's large scale and small scale. It's public. It's discreet. It's audible when it needs to be and quietly effective when that is what is required. I'm going to say a little bit about my work in scriptural reasoning and how this relates to interfidi. But first, I want to introduce a word. Um, it's a great word that I learned to use from Bob Hefner. And I'll put it in the chat. So this is the word I learned from uh, Bob Hefner, who uh, I was hoping to see this evening. Um, so this word is imbrication. And if you want to understand this word imbrication, you have to think of roof, a roof on top of a building and how the tiles are arranged on the roof. They're arranged in a uh, ordered way. They're not just overlapping, but they're able to direct the flow of water. Um, so it means connected, interleaved, ordered, overlapping, it's that sort of, of word. So with acknowledgement to Bob Hefner, I would like to suggest that the work of interfidii is a kind of imbrication of religion and politics, the large and the small, the official and the unofficial, an imbrication of the visible and the invisible. And these terms are often opposed to each other as if something must be one thing or the other. Is it religious or is it political? Is it official or is it unofficial? And I've learned to see in Interfidi's work an arrangement of these different kinds of action together in relation, like tiles on a roof, directing the flow not of water, but the flow of energy, of insight and wisdom. And if I had to sum up in one phrase what I have learned from Interfidi in the last 10 years, only 10 years, I'm a, I'm a relative latecomer, only 10 years of friendship and collaboration, if I had to sum it up, it would be wisdom in action. And I'd like to name one part of Interfidi's work that I have particularly learned from, and that is the interfaith school, Secular Lintas Iman. Mm. So now in its 11th year, I think, Secular Lintas Iman, SLE, represents an important model for interreligious engagement. So the first thing to say about it is that it seems simple in design. It consists of around 30 students across several universities, Dutta Wachana, Sanata Dharma, Uyen Sunan Kalijaga, as well as younger members of Interfidi itself. And for 14 weeks, these young people have discussions, site visits, and periods of reflection together. My colleague, Eckhart Semmerich, who's now at the University of Hamburg, who introduced me to Indonesia and introduced me to you, Ibu Elga. He and I were privileged to meet some of the participants on SLE in 2018, and we learned a great deal. Because behind the simple design, complex dynamics are at work. So first, it's, it appears to be a local matter. It's a collaboration of several Jogja institutions. But because it's made up of university students, its potential impact is much wider. These are future leaders in Indonesia and perhaps beyond. Second, it's obviously religious. The composition of participants includes Christians, Catholics, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Confucians, and Saptadana. But it's not only a matter of identity or religious administration. It's also a matter of space, of location, of place. Participants do not meet in neutral spaces, but share each other's places. And there's often religious work being done in the background while the classes meet. It's also obviously a place for meeting. The participants meet each other in ways that would be less likely on a campus in Dutawachana or Sanatadharma or Uyen Sunan Kalijaga, for example. 
and conversations become possible that would require considerable effort in other contexts. And in SLE, it looks almost effortless. And of course, that's because of the careful preparation of the facilitators and those who design it. But there are two less obvious things that I'm particularly grateful to learn and which I have learned to see in the practice of scriptural reasoning. The first is a question of genre. Now, I do a lot of interreligious engagement in many different countries, including Egypt and India, but most of it is focused on texts and shared problems. We come together to study and to repair. But Sekulal Intasiman encourages participants to present their reflections in songs and in poems, in works of art and in other forms. And this I have come to discover is a distinctly Indonesian focus and Indonesian strength. And others, including me, can learn from its transformative power. And the second is a question of time. I've been engaged for many years in scriptural reasoning, which was developed in the, USA, in the USA and is now spread all over the world, including in Indonesia. And it's a practice where participants meet from time to time to study together. Now, the main outlines of scriptural reasoning are simple enough. Um, they are, we meet to engage in practices of understanding more than trying to agree with each other, we try to understand. The second theme is one of collegiality, where we're working together with really very different ways of thinking, and we learn each other's ways of thinking, we learn each other's categories for thought. And then the third is that we make our deep reasonings public. But Interfidi, and particularly SLE, has taught me to see two more themes uh, at the heart of this. One is the theme of teaching, and one is the theme of time. And one of the basic rules of scriptural reasoning is we do not teach each other. We study together and we learn to listen as much as we speak. Those of us who teach have to learn to do this. But the really important one is of time. And I think this really links very strongly to Interfidi's work and particularly to uh, Sekulal Intasiman. This kind of repetition of doing something again and again is raised to an intense level. Participants meet for 14 weeks and that means the pace on any particular occasion is relatively slow and it builds up over time. So Interfidi performs an imbrication of politics and religion, large scale and small scale, visible and invisible. And it performs genres, forms of articulation, not just finding new ways to express old things, but producing new things that call for new forms of expression. It's an extraordinary achievement and, of course, an ongoing achievement. I've learned so much from you and I'm deeply grateful to Ivo Elga, Pa Otto and the rest of the team. Thank you. Happy birthday, Interfidi. I wish you encouragement for the next 30 years and beyond. Thank you, Professor Nicola. Oh, thank you so much for your perspective, especially on Sekolah Lintas Iman. Yeah, so Mbak Elga, uh, as, as he said, that our work actually is an imbrication of religion and politics, visible and invisible. So we must continue this, right, uh, Professor yes. Nicola Adam? It okay, is now again, 12 Professor years Nicola. already. Okay. In the faith school, yeah. Okay, thank you again, uh, Professor Nicola. This is really great. Sekolah Lintas Iman. So you have to develop more, uh, Ibu Elka, on this. Okay, so the third one will be uh, Roberto Catalano, co-director of International Office for Interreligious Dialogue and of the Focolare Movement in Rome, Italy. Please, the time is yours, Professor Roberto Catalano. Thank you so much. I hope my voice is clear because the first connection was quite yes. bad. So I have to go out and come in again. Yes, very clear. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It has been a great surprise and a great joy to be invited for this occasion. Um, I'm very, uh, very grateful to Elga, whom I know for the last, I think, 12, 13 years, from the moment we met at Vienna uh, during the second last assembly of religions for peace. So this 
that gives me the possibility also to greet in a special way the new Secretary General of Religious for Peace, Hassan Karam, because the Religious for Peace has been in all these decades a great platform for meetings among people involved, engaged in interreligious dialogue. So uh, gratitude also uh, to this big organization. Okay. Now, uh, to say a bit uh, about myself, uh, I would like to say, uh, to stress uh, three points uh, of my interfaith experience. Uh, I live for around 30 years in India, where I developed a very active and profound experience of interfaith dialogue at different le levels. Dialogue of life in the everyday living, uh, living in a metropolis like Mumbai, dialogue of spiritual experiences along with uh, Hindus in a special way, but also with people of other religions. In India, uh, we have represented practically all religions uh, present in the globe. Dialogue also cooperation uh, with different institutions, especially with Gandhian institutions. We uh, had a lot of uh, social enterprises and common ventures. And also uh, with several uh, academic in uh, university institutions, we had an exchange at the academic and theological level. Now, these three dimensions have never been uh, compartmentalized, but they have intersected with one another. And I can say it was always very difficult to distinguish one uh, from the other. Uh, 13 years ago, uh, I was invited to come back to Italy, my home country. And uh, here in Rome, I was offered the position of the director of the International Center for Interreligious Dialogue. And this uh, compelled me to dialogue not only with religions of the Sanatana Karma, as we say in India, but uh, with different religions, eh, to open up to Christian Muslim dialogue, to Christian Buddhist, to Christian Jewish, also to dialogue with uh, the uh, African religions, uh, African traditional religions. It was not easy at the beginning, but I could say it's been uh, extremely enriching. I realized that my previous experience in India didn't allow me uh, the knowledge about all the other religions, but prepared me spiritually, existentially, intellectually, uh, from the sensitiveness uh, point of view. I felt the great necessity also of uh, reflecting on my experience and try to express it in uh, theological, philosophical uh, ideas at the academic level in order to pass it on uh, to other people. And in fact, now uh, I'm leaving my present position and in a few weeks time, I will join uh, uh, Sophia University, which is uh, the Institute of the Focolare Movement opened around 13 years ago, close to Florence, where we try to reflect uh, on uh, the idea of universal fraternity, which is very dear to Pope Francis today, and it is a great engagement for the whole interfaith uh, uh, world. We try to reflect on this and try to create also new categories uh, which are not present at the academic international level in this moment and the religions are called to, um, to move on and to uh, endow the future of the academic level also from this viewpoint. Uh, one thing which is uh, uh, very close to my heart in these months, uh, it's a reflection that um, uh, this present uh, world situation with the pandemia uh, Corona uh, virus, which we are living and all experience with this uh, tragic uh, situation where we are compelled to live for the last one year and a half. And uh, probably there is no uh, respite on site for this. I realized that uh, uh, as people of uh, religion, but also as people engaged in interfaith dialogue, we have a, a vital role to play. Uh, in fact, uh, somehow uh, this pandemic situation has brought back to women and men of our present world questions which seem to be forgotten for a long time. All of us, each human being today experiences 
a life full of whys. Why this pandemic? Why in this world? Why so many victims? Why the weakest are the ones to suffer the most once again? Why all this in a phase of humanity where human race and each one of us too seem to be all powerful, almost uh, everlasting? We all have experienced all these whys and probably many more. Probably also some of us have been uh, affected in our families and our, among our friends uh, of uh, casualties, uh, people who died uh, because of the, of the virus. Now, we have to acknowledge that no one of us, no one of our groups uh, have convincing answers to all these whys. And here religions are called to play an important, I would say irreplaceable role. But there's more to this. The world has to face also, as we know very well, economic financial crisis during the corona, which coupled with the global warming, the general critical eco situation is provoking a progressive dramatic increase of the global poverty rate. Now, in front of this scenario, only people who are spiritually sensitive can accept the challenge to tie up together in order to create a widespread series of initiatives aiming at the human race common good. And I would like to underline these two words, common good. Obviously, religions are called to be the inspiring factors for these processes, which are supposed now while the pandemic is going on and probably uh, slowly uh, diminishing, now we are support, supposed to start anew. Women and men of faith, along with people of goodwill, even when not affiliated to a particular religion, we are the ones called in first person to take up initiatives. We cannot do it each according to his, her own faith tradition. We are all called to work together to meet the great challenges of today's world. Being together today means also sharing different dimensions, which are typical of each culture and religion. Today is not enough Christian love, and not even Buddhist compassion or Muslim mercy. And I could continue expressing the main spiritual values and dimensions that each of our, of our own traditions highlight. Humanity in this phase of its history needs all these values shared together by all women and men who follow the different traditions along with the ones of those who don't have a clear religious reference. Once again, no one alone can make it. We can come out of this situation only all together. And we realize that it's not enough that all people of the more affluent countries, for instance, receive the inoculation. All human beings need to be vaccinated in order to come out of this nightmare. And as people of religions, we are called also to this commitment. We cannot find solutions to all the great questions and all these challenges alone, as I said, or in our own religious circles. We need and we must work together, knowing that each faith tradition is richly endowed with something unique which can be precious element for all the others. In this way, interfaith engagement can overcome the simple context of keeping or reacquiring peace, as it was typical of interfaith movement for the last 50, 60 years. For sure, peace will remain a central goal for all of us, as we have seen wars never end, and even the pandemic, the pandemic time, has not been void of conflict, on the contrary but the interfaith movement can add new dimension to its own goals and promote a common effort towards a more shared and sustainable welfare and justice in the world. And I'm sure that together we can make it. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for allowing me to share these feelings and experiences. Thank you, uh, Professor Roberto. I agree with you. Yes, uh, especially right now in the corona, um, in the pandemic era, I think this is what we call sickness as unifier. 
So we have to collaborate. I think uh, 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 even though it is uh, uninvited, the, this uh, pandemic, but there is something benefactor. That this is this is the time that we can work together. I think that's that's I agree um, uh, completely with you. Okay, so you also have done spiritual journey to India, right? Okay, again, thank you, uh, 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 Professor Roberto Catalano. Thank you again. And now, uh, Professor Sumanto Al Kurtubi, Professor of Anthropology in King Fahd University of Petroleum and Mineral Saudi Arabia. The time is yours, Professor Kurtubi. Hello, Mbak Safa. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or maybe good night. I don't know. So, greeting from the Kingdom of Saudi what, Arabia. What in, in your country? What time now? No, it's, um, I think, yeah, at, at four o'clock now in the evening, uh, oh. 4 p.m. Okay. So, um, yeah, um, <clears throat> thank you so much, everyone, and especially Dian Intervide, which is very um, grateful. And thank you for inviting me to share my, uh, my experience or my knowledge about their religious relations um, in this um, workshop. First of all, I'm, I'm a bit confused here because I am Indonesian nationality, but, uh, but uh, in the, uh, Dian Intervide sent me to to share my experience in um, Saudi Arabia. So I'm, I'm a bit um, confused here though, because I am a double agent somehow. <laughs> as an Indonesian <laughs> on one hand, but um, as, an, as a professor, as a lecturer in, in, in Saudi Arabia. But I will, I will try to speak as, as brief as possible and about my experience first, what I have I've done here in the kingdom and I would like to share what actually <clears throat> the government, the Saudi government um, mm -hmm. has done in terms of um, interreligious dialogue and interreligious relations that might be useful for Interfide or might be useful for um, <clears throat> Indonesian in general. First of all, <clears throat> because I am a teacher of a cultural anthropology, so of course I introduce, uh, this, is, this is the beginning the beginning in my life teaching in the kingdom, teaching the whole, my student, the whole is Arab. 90-90% is Saudis, Arab Saudis, but the rest might be from, the rest might be Yemenis, might be Egyptian, or might be Jordanian, or might be English from the Gulf, which is this, is of course, the first time of, for me, which is really, um, I have very uh, interesting experience teaching cultural anthropology for Arab students is, is really uh, yeah. enjoyable on one hand, but also interesting and challenging uh, at the same time. First of all, my students were not familiar at all about uh, what exactly belief system, what exactly religion outside Islam have no familiar at all. So this is, this is what I have done. I, I teach them since the beginning how to, to respect to other religion, which is the key. This is a very important thing. So I always talk to my student um, <clears throat> using to not use ethnocentric points of view, avoid ethnocentrisms, the respect the other religion. This is, this, is, this is the norm, this is the values that I all, always teach to my, uh, to my students. And <clears throat> during the teaching, I always have a project, um, projects on a group project, on <clears throat> ethnographic project actually, on non-Islam religious um, groups or organizations or whatever. So presentation to give to give a student a project to give presentation about non. or maybe branches within Judaism, for example, or branches within Christianity, for example. 
Again, rule is one, no ethnocentric points of view. So it's, um, it's always, I always talk to my students about this and it's really interesting to find the fact in the end of the project, in the end of the presentation group project, this uh, very small thing can transform my students' points of view, my student thinking, my student understanding about um, other religions. It really, really uh, transforming their ideas. And, <clears throat> and it's not uh, this, this semester, I think then this, I, I have done this every semester. And I teach every semester, maybe about 80 until 90 students every semester. And now it's more than 1,000 students. I teach more than 1,000 um, Arab students. So imagine this young, the new generation of Saudi. In the next, in the future, I hope they could transform the kingdom to be much more, much, much better in, in terms of uh, um, how do they respect and appreciate to uh, non-Muslims. So this is, this is my hope, of course. And the second thing that I have done here in the kingdom, of course, in relation to my students, I always work together between Sunnis and Shia. Sunni, because uh, people always think Saudi is not respect to see religious, so, so to, to see Muslims. So in my, in my, um, <clears throat> in my, in my teaching and my research project in Saudi, I also always involve um, Shi'i students and Sunni students together to work in project in, 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 in different topic, in different topic, of course, but I always involve Sunni and Shi'i student. This is also um, um, very much helpful for them and can transform to minimize misunderstanding and to bridge um, um, understanding between Sunnis and Shi'i and so on and so forth. So, um, <clears throat> but um, the second point I'm going to say here is not so much about my experience, but I would like to share what exactly the Saudi governments have done in the last few years, which is, it might be useful for interview day, or might be useful for, um, for, um, <clears throat> for Indonesian societies in general. Yeah? So um, first of all, it's really um, <clears throat> interesting for me to see um, for the last few days, for the last few years, I mean, there has been a very much um, um, interesting development here in the kingdom. I, I would say is a, a good, good science, which is I hope in the future um, um, the kingdom would like to transform to become really, really a moderate um, kingdom. It's not only in terms of uh, economy, politics, social, culture, but also in terms of religious dialogue. Why? Because when you talk about religious dialogue here in the kingdom, the, the, the Saudi, well, you know, um, the, the, the kingdom is, is this is the slowest, the slowest country in the Gulf state in terms of uh, building interreligious dialogue. Well, you know this, of course. <clears throat> um, when I say Gulf state here is a, a Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, and, and, and Saudi, of course, is the slowest, is the slowest country in response to the interreligious uh, relations and dialogue. Well, <clears throat> for the second, this is the country in which, until now, there is no um, church at all, until now. Which is, if we compare to Qatar, there are several churches in Qatar, or non-Muslim <clears throat> uh, worship places, not only for Christian, but also non-Muslim. Qatar, they have some. Uh, Bahrain, they have some. <clears throat> United um, uh, Arab Emirates, they have quite also. Oman, they have uh, quite plenty. But Saudi, no a church. In, in Saudi. Of course, in the history, we have Christian community in Najran, in the southern part of Arabia. <clears throat> we have the old church here in Jubal, um, um, which is called the Jubal Church. It, 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 was, it was built in fourth um, century. In fourth century, mean before, <laughs> before the birth of Islam. And it's, um, it's still, we can, we can steal the remains of the church in, in, in Jubal, which is actually close to my, to my town here. And some say there is a there's, um, Anglican church in Jeddah, uh, which, which was built in, in about um, <clears throat> 100 years old. But, but in contemporary era, there is no church at all. So, but, um, <clears throat> so this is to say, 
the kingdom is the slowest, the slowest country in the Gulf in terms of um, interreligious um, um, dialogue. But it doesn't mean there is no change. It doesn't mean there is no hope. It doesn't mean there is no good news here. And this is what I'm going to share that might be useful even in the most conservative country like the kingdom. It change does happen. It change takes place. It does change happen. It's maybe I, I can feel it from, because I live here, I share with my new generation, with Saudi generation, young people, which is very um, good, good-minded to people, have a very, very uh, open-minded and willingness to engage with other cultures, other civilization, other religion, which is really uh, interesting to see the development and change in the kingdom. Well, <clears throat> first, um, <clears throat> what happening for the last, um, few years here in the, uh, in the kingdom, which is this is a sign, a good sign for in the religious dialogue, for in the religious relations in, in Saudi Arabia. First, um, <clears throat> maybe you are familiar with um, the initiative of the interreligious dialogue actually already took place in 2008, actually. In 2008, um, during the late uh, King Abdullah, he already initiated the interreligious dialogue. Um, if, if, you, if you are not familiar with the, <clears throat> with, the, with the list of the king in the kingdom, King Abdullah was the one of the moderate monarch, one of the moderate progressive uh, monarch that initiated many things. It's not only in terms of religious relation actually, but also in, in many things, okay? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> um, Interfaith um, initiative, which is, which is uh, first by um, King Abdullah, and then King Abdullah also established a national dialogue, which is very good to involve um, of many religious groups here in the national dialogue. It's not only within um, Hanbali thinkers, but also within Shi'i, within various groups of Shi'i, and within various groups of non Hanbali scholars involved in the national, in international dialogue. And since 2017, uh, King Salman and MBS, which is the crown screen, um, have, have, have met with uh, many um, religious leaders, especially Christian leaders. Well, they also met the um, uh, <clears throat> delegation from Vatican. They also met um, delegation from the Maronite, Lebanon's Maronite Church, met delegation from the uh, Egyptian's uh, Coptic Church, but also uh, met with the Evangelical Christian group from the United States. This is my list. Um, since 2017, and the rumor said, and from this uh, from this uh, visit, from this uh, meeting between between the political elites and religious and Christian elites, they would like to begin to initiate building church in some places in in in, in the kingdom. Some say they would like to um, revive some old churches, but some say they would like to build a new church also in the um, in the kingdom. Well, let's see what's happening, of course. And this is um, the last but not the least um, few thing. <clears throat> there is a strategy, I think, from the government's point of view. First, the most important thing is the synergy between state and society. This is what I this is what I learned from the kingdom. The synergy between state and society. State, state here represent the elite member of government, top leader, the ruling um, <clears throat> the ruling elite um, society here. In of course, is religious leaders and others. Um, the, the synergy between state and society is the key for transforming um, um, the kingdom. The first, the second is educational reform. Educational reform, maybe you are not familiar with uh, the kingdom now replace the curricula courses and also what which is, which, is, which is not good to build um, interreligious relations. They replace them with the good, good curricula, with good courses, with the teach um, more respect and more appreciation to other religions to so replace um, <clears throat> curricula which is not sport um, 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 in the religious dialogue and in the religious um, relations and replace them with religious studies that emphasize on um, cultural activism, emphasize on avoiding um, ethnocentric points of view. I know this. I learned from my kid, my kid also in, in, in school here in the kingdom. I check his Islamic studies, Islamic studies books, and it's really different from the previous one. Really different. There is um, there is no emphasis on 
on on the superiority inferiority for example emphasis on the on the similarity between um, religious tradition example and this uh, really um, um, excellent development and then <clears throat> the third one which is I, I i learned here from the kingdom is the replacement of the conservative groups conservative religious group with those more moderate yeah, more moderate ones they replace the conservative teachers, clerics, hot tips, or whatever, um, uh, imam and so forth, those who conservate, have a conservative experience, a few with this uh, uh, moderate one. So replace them all um, in the whole um, 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 kingdom, which is, which is also a good sign, I think, um, in, in the future. And the kingdom now, they promote um, Islamic moderation, just like Indonesian government, Islam wasatiyah, Ispam Hassan, of course, familiar about this. Uh, the, the promote Islamic wasatiyah or Islamic moderation has become the norm here in the king. That's mean um, as a new as a new Saudi Arabia's motto, which is to promote Islamic uh, moderation, which is which is it, this is also a very good good sign. And the fourth is um, as I said, the involvement of non-Wahhabi religious scholars in the national dialogue. There's some um, Shia group involved in this national dialogue. And, and many cleric and scholars for non hanbali they, they had been informed by the governments to be part of the uh, uh, national dialogue. This is really um, transforming and it's really also very um, um, significant development within the uh, kingdom. And then, of course, the classifications of uh, Islamic scholars and cleric. Um, there is hard course cleric. The, 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 we, we have, I think the government has um, different treatment to, to hard course clerics and moderate cleric, they have a specific special treatment for this, how to deal with hardcore clerics, how to deal with the moderate cleric and so on and so forth. So I think I think, I think think this is also important might be for Indonesian mm. government to classify, mm. <laughs> to identify hardcore, moderate, and so how to deal with this and how to transform the mental and so forth. And the last point is, of course, the use of religion, which is Islam, of course, here to foster or to boost the uh, advancement, to use religion to support a Saudi vision 2030, which is, which is sufficient to transform the kingdom to be modern, not only in terms of politics and economy, but also modern in, in cultures in cultural expression, but also in, in religious uh, points of view. I think that's it for um, from um, uh, from my side, and I always remember what what my um, colleague um, uh, John Paul Ledra said when I was working in Notre Dame in Indiana, um, Notre Dame University in Indiana. I, I work with um, Scott Appleby, and I, I work with John Paul Ledra. John Paul Ledra always said to me, "Remember when we build, um, no one." Uh, he said. Um, um, building a bridge cannot start from the middle. He always emphasized this. Building a bridge cannot start from the middle. He criticized the people who, who or, in, or interfaith group who start building um, relationship with other, with only in for moderate group, but ignore um, um, extremist conservative um, um, a group. So if we would like to bridge, uh, uh, build a bridge, we have to involve, we have to start with the um, um, conservative group, not start with the uh, moderate group. This is, this is what, what he, he always um, discussed to me. But it's really difficult. It's really difficult. How can we build, um, um, build in the religious dialogue with um, 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 without um, involving moderate group and, and 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 how do we build religious dialogue by involving a militant group? It's also as challenging. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. But it doesn't mean no hope. Again, it doesn't mean no hope. I was learning. I was. I was visiting Papua. Um, I, I have a one two minutes. Okay, Mbak Safa, one two minutes. I was I was visiting Papua. Um, 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 before COVID, of course, and I knew there that um, Jafar Umar Talib, which is he was he was the extremist leader, was responsible for Ambon War, um, leader of Laskar Jihad, and I, I I learned from Christians from my my colleague from from Papua, um, he was afraid because 
because Jafar Umar Tholib built the pesantren in Papua. Built the pesantren, and he was afraid because of because the presence of Jafar Umar Tholib, who was who was responsible with jihadist Alaskar Jihad leader, and he built church in 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 Papua. But I try to calm down. Um, okay, just meet him, with him. Try to open, try to dialogue, try to, to talk, uh, maybe person to person, and let's see what's happening. And they did what I said. <laughs> they met, <clears throat> they met Jafar Kumar Tholib and talked in person, and then try to to to, to solve uh, what 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 need to be done um, um, for uh, for the society of Papua. So so actually, um, yeah, actually there is many things that we need to talk. We need to um, um, discuss in this case, which is which is not easy, of course. How to deal with the militant group, conservative group, and how 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 should involve them in the dialogue project and so forth. But it doesn't mean um, 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 impossible is nothing. It is according to um, Adidas. Is, I like this actually. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you so much, Ba Safa and Ba Elga for um, for inviting me to this. Um, I'm really appreciate and maybe you can continue. And, and, uh, thank okay, you. thank you so much, uh, Professor Kurtubi. Oh, this is a good news actually. Um, and you did a great job uh, and you, do, you did uh, intra-faith and also interfaith. So you try to, what is it, to involve Sunni and CE. That's a good job actually. Uh, uh, and, and that's a good news also and what, what happening in, in Saudi. So I hope what you you have done uh, will have a great impact. Um, uh, what is that for the youngest maybe? Uh, uh, because we still hope a lot of young uh, people. And now we are coming to, this is the young, maybe the youngest, uh, uh, what is it, uh, uh, speakers. So Pilbert Aganyo, chairperson of Kenya Interface Youth Network, Nairobi. So Pilbert Aganyo, the time is yours. So let's listen to the youngest uh, speaker now. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate the invitation and uh, I'm glad to be here. Allow me to first of all, uh, start by uh, uh, acknowledging uh, some of my friends from Indonesia. I'm also, uh, I may have had uh, uh, an interaction with some of my friends from Indonesia and uh, it gives me so much joy to be with them. Uh, first, I think Jesslyn Meta and myself, we serve at uh, the Religions for Peace Youth Media Team. Uh, and, and I want to uh, acknowledge that uh, indeed it has been an awesome time working together. And there's also Abdil, Jesslyn and Abdil uh, Fortanas together, good friends to me. So I may have had and taste and experience of Indonesia Oh, let me also mention, uh, mention Cornelius. Cornelius Salana, I believe. Uh, Cornelius came to Nairobi, I uh, think about uh, two years ago, and it was such a privilege to get to meet with them. Uh, allow me to also acknowledge uh, Professor Azar Karam, who is uh, the Secretary General of uh, the Religions for Peace International. If not for the work that uh, they do at the Religions for Peace uh, International, uh, I don't think the youth media team would have been there and we wouldn't have continued to do the work that we do. Can you take me to the next slide, please? I, I, I did not intend, actually uh, didn't mean to, to give a presentation in light of uh, what my, the speakers that have won ahead of me have shared. I also wanted to just take some time to reflect, but nonetheless, I will just take you very fast through these uh, five or so slides. So a brief introduction of the Kenya Interfaith Youth Network. When I saw the topic about reflection uh, reflections around uh, interfaith work and uh, the brief that was shared with us talked about politics and how politics and religion, being that all of us have had an experience of the bad interplay between these two. So I thought of maybe drawing some experiences from uh, the organization that I represent, which is the Kenya Interfaith Youth Network. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll not even take a lot of time here. This is just uh, it's, 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 a, it's an organ of the Interreligious Council of Kenya that mainstreams the voices of young people in the work that we do. And uh, when uh, the team uh, led by Cornelius came to Nairobi, they actually met some of our members. What we are doing is uh, we have a lot of activities and initiatives that help us in uh, uh, speaking to our colleagues 
about the benefits of peace and uh, the benefits of uh, you know, welcoming the other. We do not have to use religion as a point of division. Yes, we all have different religious beliefs, but should those, why should we allow those to, to separate us or to create distinctions uh, among us as uh, this ideally should be an opportunity for us to you know, embrace each other's diversity. Uh, you know, there's a lot of diversity in what we do and even in our practices. Can we use these for common action? Next slide, please. Uh, we work to complement the work that uh, the Intermediate Council of Kenya does. And uh, in all its programmatic areas, we are there to specifically talk about youth activities and youth initiatives. And so just a brief background, even as we go into my sharing, Kenya's population as at uh, the, the 2019 population census uh, was about 47.6 million. And out of this 37.5 million uh, are young people below the age of 35 years. And of course we know by standard that below the age of 35, uh, you become a youth. That simply means that 75% of Kenya's total population uh, is youth. And, 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 and that to me is a, is a very striking uh, statistic. Uh, we also have the, the same, same census data shows that uh, there's widespread unemployment amongst the young people. Uh, if you compare the rates within East Africa, 5.5% and 6.8% uh, respectively for Tanzania and Uganda, Kenya is at the highest. Uh, and, 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 and this is according to a World Bank report. Also, the kind of initiatives that are being used to create jobs uh, for young people uh, are also not sustainable. You know, there's the component of sustainability in the kind of job creation. And where does this leave us? Uh, that Kenya, allow me to just quote another statistic which is not included in here, that 85.5% of Kenya's total population uh, is Christian, 11% is Muslim, and then 2% uh, is uh, composed of the other demographics. We have the Hindus, we have the Baha'is, we have the Sikhs, and all these other traditional uh, African religions. So to only 2% uh, of the total population of Kenya is unaccounted for in terms of religion. So that simply means about 99% of Kenya's total population subscribe to a particular religion. Now, the next question that I'm going to ask is, if every person in Kenya subscribes to a particular religion. And of course we know the ideals of religion, peace, harmony. The, the next question is which, which puzzles everyone? Why then, including politicians, by the way, including politicians, because every Friday, every Sunday, every Saturday, we see them going to houses of worship and we see them taking time to, you know, to pray at least. And so the question is, why then do we still have violent situations? Why don't do we still have violence? What you see in that uh, is a video uh, by Al Jazeera uh, in the post-election violence. Our time might not allow me to play it, but the conclusion that I want to give is that Kenya is a typical case of a time bomb. It's a ticking time bomb, which unless checked will one day explode. And, and, and I know very well that you people uh, uh, my, my, my distinguished uh, uh, religious leaders in this call, I know that in your respective countries, there are particular portions that uh, resonate well with this kind of statistic. It's not only Kenya, it's actually across Africa and across many other continents. Unless some situations are checked, some narratives are changed, there's a ticking time bomb that will one day explode. Next slide, please, as we uh, bring this to, uh, to an end. No, 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 just next slide, please. Uh, not the video. Thank you. But if you see the people who are fighting there, this is a, 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 an excerpt that well captures the video that is in the, uh, in, in, the, in the previous slide. These photos were taken in Kenya, and all these are situations that took place uh, in 2017 when Kenya last had its general election. Now, I will boldly and uh, confidently say that about 90%, no, no, 90 is a, is a bit too, about 80% of every person you're seeing in these photos, including the security personnel, the security forces in the top right corner, that is the anti-riot police uh, about to, uh, to, 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 to beat up. They were actually beating up people. And you can see behind that 
yellow pole, there's a woman, a lady who is crying, frightened and scared, literally, from uh, the security forces. They do not know that she is there, but there's a news, uh, a journalist was able to take this photo. Now, about 85% of people in these photos are below the age of 35, young people, youth, like myself. And so the other question that we should ask ourselves is when, as we reflect, I know there are so many other young people in this call, in this webinar. The question that I want us to ask ourselves is, what role are we going to play in violence or in nonviolence in our countries? Let that be a rhetorical question, even as we reflect upon Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, quote here, that true peace is not merely the absence of tension, it is the presence of justice. Let us go to the next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. Without peace, there can be no, without justice, there can be no peace. This simply exemplifies the fact that peace and justice are two sides of one coin. And so uh, one lesson, uh, the title of uh, my presentation, I believe you saw from the first slide is that, uh, uh, you know, what lessons can we draw from, uh, from, 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 from the present time that can take us in the future, that can inform us even as we move ahead into the discussions that will lead uh, us for moving forward. So the first thing that I'd want us to reflect upon is the word justice. Do you think there can be peace without justice? Your answer, your guess is as good as mine. Let us go to the next slide as we draw this to uh, a close. Now, this photo, I will not even talk about this, uh, but the photo that you see in that uh, looks like one of a rebel soldier uh, or maybe a bandit somewhere. But I want to shock you that that photo uh, is mine. That is me. The person you're seeing in that photo is me. And the image and the gun that you're seeing there, that's a real gun, uh, an AK-47 rifle, very lethal weapon, and it was fully loaded. The magazine that you're seeing there does not have uh, uh, sticks or something. It has live bullets nine millimeter rounds. And so this happened at a time uh, at the height of the post-election violence. And whereas this was just a photo that I took in part of uh, the Northern part of Kenya where I was work, I was stationed as a program officer. Whereas the photo was taken as part of, you know, just the activities that we were doing, the photo reflects exactly what I was feeling at that point. Why? I, unfortunately, I was not neutral. Uh, I would want to say that I had a political candidate that I was supporting and my candidate was defeated uh, in an election that I uh, will not say whether it was fair or unfair, but uh, I will simply say that we all have our favorite candidates in any political cycle for starters. But the question that we need to ask ourselves, uh, when, what will we do when we are faced with a situation or uh, to join violent situations or not? regardless of which denomination or religious affiliation that you subscribe to. So some of the reasons why I encourage using the Kenya Interfaith Youth Network that I chair, and also the, the, the young people that we engage with on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of the things that we do is we first of all identify commonalities that bring us together. We all, uh, we all respect the sanctity of human life. And we also would love to be in a cohesive and we want to peacefully coexist with each other. And we also want to have better mental health and well-being. Nobody wants loss and damage. Across Africa, there are so many cases of loss to, of property and even lives during seeing this happening across. I, I, I usually get uh, so disturbed when I see uh, Africans trying to cross the Mediterranean into Spain, France, and uh, uh, and, uh, and and the question that I always ask uh, is how bad can the situation back uh, at their respective countries get so much so that people want to cross, they want to risk their lives, they want to risk everything. And we've seen scenarios where some of these things, uh, some of their, the boats that they use capsize. And, 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 and it, it's such a bad situation. Take me to the next slide, please, as we... Uh, so so uh, uh, this brings me to this uh, slide. What lessons have we learned that we can uh, always 
uh, that we can constantly keep ringing in our heads, even as we move forward. These are my points of reflection. And the first item is, we need to realize that this world belongs to all of us. There is no world for Muslims. There is no world for Christians. There is no world, there is no earth for Hindus. This world belongs to all of us. And the sooner we learn to coexist together peacefully, the better for everyone. The second thing is neutrality is core, but not in situations of injustice. There are situations where we are told that as a religious people, I remember in Kenya, there's a time that the religious sector, for lack of a better term, was, was referred to as the betrayers, the biggest betrayers, why? Because they were neutral at a time when they were supposed to speak out against some of the injustices in a political regime. That's why Bishop Desmond Tutu says that if you're neutral, in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. If we want to foster uh, a harmonious society, then I believe one lesson that we need to learn even as we move forward. As a young person, this is something that I hold so dear to me. I wouldn't want to be neutral in a situation where there's blatant injustice. But the question is, this is where now interfaith dialogue comes in. Interfaith dialogue is a tool that can be used to diffuse any tense situation. And that is why many, at least every religious leader needs to undergo serious training of interfaith or interreligious dialogue. I want to thank initiatives like uh, King Abdullah's Kaisid, which trains religious dialogue, uh, trains religious leaders into becoming dialogue champions, champions on interfaith and intercultural dialogue. These are some of the tools and lessons and the liberate initiatives that we need to, uh, to push forward even as we move along. And I want to encourage every young person who is here to apply to attend this. I applied and I did not make it, but I will still keep applying. Some of these are some of the initiatives and opportunities that we need to take advantage of when we are still young Train up a person, a child, when you're still young, and they will not depart from it. That is a text from the Bible, uh, the Holy Scripture that we subscribe to. Let me finish. Positive use of social media and digital platforms. Young people, if you look at the presence, our presence on social media is so much. Let us use social media positively. Let us share the knowledge that we have. And let us, and, and there is no, there is enough for everyone if only we could share. This is the last reflection that I want to give, that there is enough for everyone if only we could share. Some of the reasons why people fight even for political power, my understanding of, politi of politics, uh, I, my background is politics. I studied political science and public administration at the University of Nairobi. But the basic understanding of politics is, the basic definition, sorry, it is the authoritative distribution of resources. Now, if people decide to, uh, people in leadership decide to a mass or, do, or, 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 or they simply refuse to equitably distribute of the resources that are there, then you will find a particular sect or a particular tribe or a particular section or faction of the population saying that we have been denied the opportunity to do what? To also become successful or to also have a share of these resources. And that is where again, as religious people, we come in and as young people, we need to come in strongly in this to ensure that there is good governance so that resources are distributed equally. There is enough for everyone. If only we could share. Last slide, please. Last slide. Thank you. I will just want to say this. This is drawn from the book of Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. I subscribe to the Christian religion. And this talks about, let us be wise as serpents, but as harmless as the doves. Serpents are very shrewd, but doves are very harmless and are very humble. If we can find a, a wonderful or a great mix, a perfect mix of being shrewd and being smart, as religious people, we are not to be dumb, we are not to be the stupid, we are not, Sorry for, sorry, for, sorry for using that. We are not supposed to be, to, be, to, be, to be the last. We are not supposed to be the very bottom of the society. We are supposed to occupy the top seats. And that is why I get so happy when I see 
Christians, Muslims, uh, re uh, Hindus, religious leaders being appointed to government positions. Why? Because I know that that's an opportunity for them to propagate some of the ethical ideals for which we stand. And that is why we should be as smart as possible so that we occupy these positions and institute change. Thank you so much. I want to encourage the young people in this call, let us seize every opportunity to be good and to do good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Pilbert Agano. Yeah, I think, thank you for sharing your experience. I think this is uh, what happened. Um, you said that 90, 90% belong to religion, but why there is uh, still many violence. So I think it is about justice. I agree with that. So Martin Luther King, I agree with Martin Luther King, but peace is not just the absence of tension. It is the presence of justice. And if you are natural in this kind of situation of injustice, so, you are in the side of the oppressor. So that's great. So thank you again. I think this is a lesson learned that we can uh, we can see that in another country, um, uh, what is that, what kind of, of interfaith actually is doing is just contextual. This is what, what you experience in your country. I think right now, especially in South Africa also, there is still a lot of riot, right? Especially uh, uh, in, in, the, in current day. Okay, thank you again, Bilbert Agano. Um, now we are coming to Israel, Yehuda Stolov. Are you there, Yehuda? I'm here. Hi. Okay, thank you. How's Israel? Now you can share about Israel to us because I think this is, uh, what is that, uh, an issue right now also uh, uh, in, in our country. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Yehuda. I want first to congratulate Interfide for this amazing achievement of 30 years of uh, amazing activity. Uh, and thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with, uh, as you said, old, old friends. Um, I will start with uh, describing what the Interface Encounter Association is doing. Uh, it is focused uh, on the Holy Land. Um, uh, that's the main focus, even though we have activity also outside the Holy Land. Um, the, the challenge here, as you well know, is uh, building uh, intercommunal relations between Jews and Muslims and Christians and Druze. Um, most peace uh, efforts are focused on uh, uh, trying to convince people to support uh, political agreements. We do not do that. We focus, I think like Interfide mostly, on the grassroots, building uh, connections between neighboring communities, building bridges between neighbors who don't have any interaction between them or hardly have any interaction. Um, and we use for that the interfaith dialogue. So for us, interfaith dialogue is not what we do. It's not about enrichment or uh, learning new things for their own sake but it's the tool that we are using to build bridges between communities. And it is a, a very effective tool because uh, it enables us to encompass all parts of the society. Um, interfaith uh, encounter uh, takes the conversation to a deeper level, a level that has, even for the most secular person, uh, existential value, which reveals to the others uh, the, the, the deep being, which, uh, which is always uh, polity, positive and uh, inspiring. So people look in, in arch, each other in the eye and magic happens. It also reveals to people how much they have in common, which is for new people a real revelation. And maybe more important is that it enables people to discuss differences in a constructive way that makes the conversation richer and not uh, and doesn't threaten the conversation and through this people train themselves to discover to develop friendships with people they disagree with which is the real challenge we are facing uh, the main uh, uh, way that we work with through is uh, ongoing groups that connect um, uh, connect neighboring communities. Uh, the groups meet uh, every every month, some of them every two weeks, some of them every week, 
some of them a bit less, but uh, at least every, every month. Um, and they first provide an opportunity for encounter because even though communities are here in um, uh, there are rare opportunities for real conversation. And if there's a group around, there's a time and place that someone can join. The group also develops as an, uh, an example for the larger uh, community um, that uh, peaceful relations are possible, uh, even friendly relations, even relation, relations of care and of uh, mutual acceptance and even uh, real friendship uh, are possible, even between Israelis and Palestinians, even between settlers and Palestinians, even between uh, Salafis and settlers. So, I mean, everything is possible once you open your ears and you open your heart and uh, you look each other in the eye. Um, until now, we established 111 groups in the Holy Land. Before the pandemic, 44 of them were active. Uh, during the pandemic, it went down to 20. Now it's going back uh, gradually. Now we are at 30 something. We also have a few groups that develop outside the Holy Land because the model that we use is very simple to implement, which is, I think, one of its strengths. So we have also groups uh, in North America. We, we had one starting before uh, the pandemic in Kenya. And there's one coming hopefully soon in uh, Abu Dhabi. Um, the relations with uh, Interfide started I think 21 years ago, when uh, someone introduced me to Elha by email, and then uh, I was fortunate enough to join uh, the conference in uh, Yogyakarta in the year 2000. And uh, following that, uh, I was again fortunate to host Elha in her visit to Jerusalem. And uh, I was uh, I was meeting uh, Shafa a few times in the US and. Lately, I, I think I met Rueda maybe two years ago. She was also in Jerusalem. And uh, from the beginning, I, I, I felt that there's a lot of uh, uh, synergy between these two organizations, with, which goes to Shafa's your third question, the importance of uh, different organizations, different people who are active in different approaches uh, in similar situations to um, or in similar approaches to come together, learn from each other, share best practices, and sometimes uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, plan and, uh, and uh, realize together, together um, projects that can uh, reinforce the work of both. In, as I say, in good cooperation, one and one are more than two. Um, I, so I invite all of you to visit our website. I will put it on the um, on the chat box uh, in a minute. Uh, make contact, join our list. Uh, we send out updates, uh, and you are all welcome to join them. And uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, have a nice evening, morning, afternoon. Thank you, Yehuda. Yes, everything is possible when you are open your heart. That's right. So looking at the eye so we can see, is it sincere or not, right? <laughs> okay, thank you, Yehuda. Uh, uh, I remember uh, you come to my uh, to Chicago, right? At the time when I was in Chicago also. So long time not see, it's many years. Thank you again. Now coming to my professor, Nelly van Doren Harder, uh, a professor at the uh, Department of Department for the Study of Rajanvek Forest University, United States, and also professor at the Center of Islamic Theology for a University, Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Um, uh, professor uh, Nelly, um, the time is yours. Maybe you can also, because your, your, what is that, your concern is on women, so you can also mention about women interfaith, Professor Nelly. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Bu Shafa, Professor Shafa. Um, well, first of all, uh, congratulations to all of you 
who have been part of Indifidae during the last 30 years. As I am uh, looking at the names there on this uh, video, I see that there are many friends, people that uh, I personally have met over the years and stayed in contact with and um, have learned, and I've learned a lot from all of you. Uh, as we all discovered uh, the different aspects of interface engagement. And um, I also, before I continue, by the way, I have to convey uh, Robert Hefner's apologies that he cannot be here with us today because his father-in-law passed away unexpectedly. So today he is on his way to Michigan from Boston, where he lives, to arrange the funeral with, of course, Ibu Nancy, Ibu Nancy Hefner, Smith Hefner. And so we convey our condolences to both of them as they are going through this sad time. Um, but uh, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Nicholas, for reminding us that Professor Bob Hefner is fantastic in putting things in one word. He's always brilliant in uh, somehow defining, uh, yes. creating a definition we're all looking for. Uh, and in this case, the word imbrication, that things are all interconnected and one needs the other. If you have indeed tiles on a roof, without one tile, the other one cannot stay. And um, I would like to start with um, a memory about Interfidei. Um, that is very vivid in my mind and that I actually have used many times in my teaching. Um, it, is, uh, it shows to me the importance of friendship. Um, uh, 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 Dr. Yehuda Stolov just mentioned that as well. Uh, friendships are very important to set up all kinds of initiatives, start projects. And often um, if we are uh, friends in the same profession, we can actually do uh, a double, uh, double efforts if you count it all up. It was in 1995 when our second child, Hannah Marie, was born in October that Interfidei had a Christmas celebration. And during that celebration, they um, had invited uh, both uh, uh, Muslims and Christians to share um, the, what they learned about Jesus and St. Mary, of course, uh, both in the Quran and in the Bible. And it was Professor Mahasin who at that time uh, made me aware of an absolutely lovely hadith that I did not know until then, the tradition about St. Anna, Hannah, who is the mother of St. Mary, who was visited by an angel and was foretold that she would give birth to a prophet. And lo and behold, how confused she was that the prophet turned out to be a girl. And she probably must have thought that, that the angel was wrong. Now, this story not just very much moved me privately and always stayed in my mind, but has also guided me a lot in my teaching. Here in America, I teach in an or in a environment. I teach in the South of America. Most of my students come from evangelical Christian churches, have very seldom learned something about Islam, or if they have, they often um, have been um, served very biased information or what, what we could say misinformation. And I often use this story as an example of what the Islamic tradition is and can be and how Muslims use this tradition to keep stories alive. And then I connect it with the Christians that I know in the Middle East, because some of you might know, I have deeply studied the Coptic church in Egypt where this, this tradition also is very much alive, while it has been forgotten in the West. And um, if, we, if we think about this teaching, we see that it is very important to go from the micro level to the macro level. Because when I think back of these meetings in Interfidei, 
then um, if you look at it on the face of it, it, look, it seemed we were on a very micro level. But in fact, looking back over the course of almost 30 years, one sees the macro develop because in those meetings, very many people present were future leaders, people I now meet across Indonesia and sometimes even across the world who have moved into all kinds of positions of leadership where they um, are in charge of uh, projects, departments, or um, and it does not necessarily have to be interface. It is not about that. It is about the leadership qualities that they in, in a way gained while participating in the interface activities. And this is something where I want to come back to my teaching here in the States, because one thing we realized was that if we um, think about what, what is it that is also really important in the faith, it is really also about leadership. It's leadership qualities that are very important to help build civic strength. And thank you so much uh, to bring up the, the theme of justice, because uh, justice, uh, that is a very important aspect of thinking about interfaith, um, uh, not just dialogue, encounters, but simply learning to respect each other, learning to see the other for what she or he is. And, and so, Great leadership can create justice, and justice is a civic strength that underlies healthy community lives. And that is something that um, is very interesting that we discussed COVID as a unifier. Well, here in the United States, as you know, COVID has become the great divider. It has shown how polarized our society is mm -hmm. and what issues such as misinformation and lack of information or bad teaching can do. And I think all these elements can be applied to the teaching of learning about each other, about religions, not our own. And when I come back to the leadership, I really want to highlight some of these issues. Uh, for example, um, apart from justice, um, thinking about issues such as the religions that are not our own can help develop purpose-based uh, values. It can help uh, people to think about the values that we all hold dear and why one group has holds on to certain values while other groups think that, I, that they are futile or minor. Um, also, it helps integrate the personal with the professional. And I think when we look here today at what is happening in this meeting, all of us who are present today are in many ways integrating the personal and the professional in our lives as leaders. Because one issue of uh, leadership training is to realize that we can all be leaders wherever we are in however small ways. The leadership does not mean just to do grand things or be the CEO of an important company. Um, but also we, it is important to learn that context shape identities. And I think Interview Day has been very important and very instrumental in doing that, in training many, many generations of leaders in, it, like I said, in Indonesia, but also outside Indonesia, um, we, to think about these issues that, to realize how people, uh, that where they are born, how they were trained, that that very much influences how they look at the world. And, and inclusivity, of course, is something I, I, I mentioned, but I think it is underlying this entire effort and thinking about the common good. And then, then that is what brings us back to justice because justice is for the common good. So what are, for example, when you think about leadership and when I connect that to my courses here in the States and especially with a colleague, I developed a course called um, Interfaith Engagement and Leadership because um, part of this course is that the students start to think about how do you create 
authoritative? How do you look at yourself? How do you explain to others what, what it is that has, that has shaped your vision on the world? And how do you identify your purposes and objectives? And at the same time, what do you do as a leader to help others to have certain experiences? Do you show them a video? Do you bring them together with other people? All of these things are activities that Interfide has been extremely instrumental in, in, um, in promoting all kinds of levels of interfaith activities, interfaith engagement, and interreligious encounters. Uh, not just in Indonesia, but in many ways also outside. So facilitating and stimulating experience is very important when we think about issues of leadership, especially in this context of interface engagement and to empower people to see that their own story matters. And that then brings them to understand that the story of others matters too. And, um, and finding models. And I think that is also something that Interfide has been very, very, uh, has been very important, has played an important role in that we have found models. All of us have, through Interfide, gotten to know people who became models for us or people that we worked with together. As I said, friendships often lead to cooperation, often, often lead to working together, to creating new projects together. So, so in a way, in a, a, an organization like Interfide has been really an incredible incubator for future leaders. And these, these I, I, I remember Ibu Yuzin mentioning the food that Pasu Martana always stressed was important. Yeah, just having a meal together can be very powerful. And we do not know how this then translates in future. Um, I want to highlight um, a few more things, if I may. Um, first of all, uh, the different uh, projects that Individe has entertained over the years. And one of the projects that I found very powerful, and I know I should mention lots of projects, but I, I'm just wanting to highlight two because uh, my time, our time is limited. The first one is the education project, the project to um, teach high school teachers to, to um, about polarization about um, uh, radical forms of thinking and how to counteract certain trends that they were, had to cope with within their schools. I think this, this project showed us very, uh, a very, very important elements of the importance of different levels of interfaith. It showed the importance of research that we always have to continue doing research and know the facts. And especially nowadays with the internet, there is a lot of misinformation. We see, um, uh, again, coming back to the States, but it's not just the States. We see a lot of polarization growing across the world because of misinformation and especially relations between uh, uh, peoples of different faiths uh, they can be really uh, cut short or destroyed by misinformation about each other. So finding the right facts, helping people understand what is really happening remains one of our main tasks as we are all here on this uh, seminar, as we are all present here. And then part of that is help clarify purposes and objectives. This uh, never stops being vital because if you do not understand why people do what they do and how they do it, you cannot understand what drives them, what moves them. And at the same time, it helps uh, people develop virtues such as empathy, such as trying learning to understand each other, but also learning to understand oneself. And this is where it, cycles back to leadership. And then the, um, and for example, um, um, uh, here, the American Civil Liberties Union just put out a large statement about misinformation saying that 
if that stressing the importance of civil society groups, groups in civil society at all levels to help people, consumers of the internet discern the truth from misinformation or discern misinformation from the truth. So the other point I wanna highlight of the activities uh, that very much impressed me in, in, in the FIDE shows that they have been really pioneers in many occasions in the history, in the short history of 30 years, because 30 years, it seems long for an organization, but in, in the historic perspective, it's short, is they have been pioneers in entertaining all kinds of topics that later on grew in importance and um, somehow uh, not just gained more relevance, but also received more attention. And one of these topics is, of course, the indigenous religions, the position of the indigenous. Now I say religions and one of you put in this chat, we shouldn't speak about religions because agama is a difficult word in Indonesia. We should speak about faith, you know, and with indigenous religions, we often mention kaberjayaan. But I think this, 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 this attempt, this boldness and this courage, because it, it, it requires courage to go where others have not gone yet, to, to point out that the indigenous faiths had to teach us something and were very important and that they um, were of enduring relevance to Indonesia, uh, although they were for the longest time not accepted in the officially accepted Pancasila religions, they, they were the underlying force for many people. And I think that is, this is also, it shows that sometimes you cannot see the future or the future seems to be a black, a black hole to you. And yet, if you feel convinced that there is truth in what you're doing, that you should not give up. And now we know that um, indigenous religions have got, gained much larger uh, acceptance and respect in Indonesia. We have large projects at uh, 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 Gajamada University um, uh, under the leadership of uh, Zainal Abedin uh, just uh, a few years ago. Um, and that must have been pro COVID, <laughs> pre COVID. So it must have been 2019 or 2018. Had a very large uh, conference, which was the first international conference on Indonesian indigenous religions, which was extremely inspiring. And all of us who were present learned a lot. And it is easy to forget that groups like Interfide really were very much part of creating a foundation, a foundation for these new initiatives that continue to go on. So I think my time is up, um, but what I want to uh, end with is of course, wishing all of us that we will have uh, many more years of working together, of being connected to, to Interfide as friends and supporters uh, of Interfide and of uh, participants of Interfide. And that by itself, what you have been doing, what Interfide has been doing to celebrate this um, anniversary by creating four videos, four uh, seminars that have been taped, the four videos of just these seminars are very powerful tools. When we listen to it, I myself learned a lot again today from the different voices, from the, all of you are also reading what you said in the chat. Every time we learn more when we engage and people who watch these videos, you know, they will learn more. They will, it will help them understand certain issues better. For example, who knows about Kenya? It will help them understand what's happening there. And, it, it, and, and again, they were a wonderful opportunity for explanation and they can help change the frame of reference that we are all stuck with in our own thinking. So I thank Interfide for its boldness and its courage. And I thank Ibu Elga Sarapong, of course, and uh, together with um, our beloved Pa uh, Sumardono, who uh, we hope is looking down on us from heaven. Um, I thank you all for uh, all the work you have done and for going where others did not dare to go yet and for guiding us in, on this journey. Thank you all and may God bless you all. I want to really 
stress that we are all praying for Indonesia as we read the COVID news that is coming uh, from the country. Our churches are praying and we have put you on all kinds of praying lists, prayer lists because as Bahma has since said, starting out, it is God who is in charge. But of course, we have agency and free will. We can pray for all, the good of all of you. May God bless all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Nelly, for highlighting the activities that Interfide have been, um, have been doing. And we hope also we will do continue to do. So also stay safe and, and healthy also, Ibu Nelly, in the US. I think we, we also knew about about what is the, uh, the current situation in the United States about uh, COVID-19. And even though you are no, a lot of people no, not, not using anymore, what is that? Uh, uh, face what, what, mask. Yeah, face mask, but that's too dangerous, I think, right? So <laughs> we still have to be more careful uh, because of this uh, virus. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you again, uh, Professor Nelly uh, uh, for, all of you have done for us uh, and continue to do. I think you always come and uh, come and forth to, to Indonesia, right? And you're always visiting our, our institution here. Okay, thank you again. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have to, to mention that unfortunately, a professor, Dr. Azakaram, uh, she has to leave, she, she, she wrote in this chat, she said, a greeting of peace, my sincere apologies, as I absolutely know, have to leave for another appointment. It has been an honor to share these last two hours with you and to learn so much. Interfide set a number, a noble example of interface essence. The distinguished speakers have identified what they live and they will celebrate how faith is integral to all aspects of dignity of people and planet. Religions for Peace is humbled by the effort of each of all of you as we recognize the legacy and values of the work done by Dr. Elga and all distinguished members and speakers within and around Interfide. Well, I'm sorry I now have to leave. I'm deeply grateful for your inspiring wisdom and admirable legacies and wish Interfide and all distinguished partner on the journey of faith of the best. So uh, now coming to the end, uh, the last but not least speaker, the honor, <laughs> I mean the director of Dian Interfide or Dian Institute, Institute Interfide Yogyakarta, Professor, no, Reverend Elga Sarapu. But Elga, the time is yours. Belga, are you there? Me. Okay. Hello. Can yeah. you can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, unfortunately, Professor Aza left, but it's fine. Okay. Uh, first, well, I I will not give you an um, official presentation, I mean, uh, but I have some points that I would like to express. First of all, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to all attendances, friends and resource persons. Uh, let me call your name, <laughs> just uh, an, uh, as what I always call you, uh, Nelly and Masuanto, Yehuda, Nick, Yusin, Philbert, Roberto, and Asa, who just left. And also to Bashafa, our moderator, throughout this whole process of webinar. I have listened very closely to all the presentations shared. We plan to process all the materials from the four webinar series of this 30th anniversary and study them all further and see which ones we need to follow up to strengthen our interfaith movement network for peace 
in Indonesia, Asia Pacific, and globally, internationally. In Indonesia, this movement has existed for a long time and is growing in every circle, especially among the youth. It has also developed in the government, in civil societies, including religious institutions, religious leaders, and belief, schools, campuses, and other sectors. It is only about, it is not only about issues of how to bring together differences and connect, but also how differences become a positive joint force for justice, humanity, and peace. Yes, for the integrity of people's life. There is a question for all of us present here, those from Indonesia and other countries in our respective countries, how can we work together and become a common force for peace through harmonious means that strengthen one another? How can we encourage each other be in solidarity with each other for justice and truth. Live together in peace regardless of religions, ethnicities, races, genders, accomplish anything for the sake of living life humanly to be meaningful to one and all and for the universe. As you as our respective nations actively move forward and desire change, our work will still exist, developed well through all its challenges and threats. Thus, we need commitment and integrity and positive expectation for peace. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mbak Sapa. Thank you, Mbak Elga. Uh, do we have time for a question answer or not? No, ma'am, just uh, go ahead for a uh, closing statement maybe. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we heard wonderful experiences and thought from our speakers. And no uh, speakers, could you please give your closing word for one minute each? Begin with Ibu Josin. Ibu Josin, could you please give your closing word? Ibu Josin, are you still there? Yes, I am still here. Okay. Uh, Go I ahead, did, Ibu I mute the microphone. Um, well, I'm. I was very much impressed by this uh, evening uh, to hear all people who are working in interface relations. And I think it's very good to stress interface. Um, and also uh, that we all together work on, on justice and peace in the, coming, in the coming time, because that's so very important in, in the world with uh, so many violations and and so on so well i hope we we can do that together thank you very much okay yes thank you ibu josin uh professor nicola adam nicola adam are you okay, still yes there? i'm still here okay. um, go ahead thank you bro at birthday parties you often meet new people okay how, how wonderful to have such uh, an intellectual gathering um, to discover new friends and new networks. One of the greatest gifts of Interfidee to us is your astonishing network of people. And I'm very grateful to be part of our wider network after this webinar. May there be many, many more in the future. Congratulations. Thank you, Professor Nicola. Professor Roberto Catalano. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for this wonderful experience. I think that uh, interfaith dialogue, as we all know very well, requires a lot of patience, 
a lot of endurance and also sometimes a bit of heroism to go against the current, against the main tide. So I think that these 30 years of Interfide prove uh, the great value uh, in front of these uh, elements we just spelled out. I wish uh, ad multos annos, as we say in Latin, many years to come, and uh, especially many years to come together. As uh, Pope Francis always says, interfaith dialogue is a key word, which is uh, together. So together we go ahead. Thanks a million. Thank you, uh, Professor Roberto. Okay, now Professor Sumanto Alcortubi. Could you please give your closing word? Um, thank you so much, uh, Safa. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to appreciate um, Dian Interfide, which is, of course, I know very well, has been long time working on interfaith relation, interfaith dialogue. Um, but of course, one thing that is very challenging for all of us is not only for Interfide, but also for those who work for a grassroots peace building, those who work for conflict resolution practitioner. It's just like I would like to remind what uh, John Paul Ledra has said, I quoted earlier, which is we cannot, um, all of us cannot build a bridge starting from the middle, which is we cannot, would easy to build connection with moderate group with them. Um, it, it's not challenging, but how to deal with the conservative group, how to deal with the extremist group, how to deal with the radical groups. This is a strong um, critic from John Paul Letra. John Paul was a, a long, long, long time working on peace building projects. I know very well. And this is a very, um, of course, this is a challenging for all of us, how to approach them, how to deal with them. This is not only in, in Indonesia, but also here in the kingdom also is uh, very much a challenging. But as I said, um, also in my <clears throat> previous presentation, uh, impossible is nothing, which is there is still, there is a hope. There is new hope. There is um, um, still hope still in, in the future if we would like to be a connection with, with all people and try to uh, preach uh, with the extremists, with the, with the, with the group working on, 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 on violence and so on and so forth, and try to deal with them, engage with them, um, try to approach them, and, and I think it will be a good for Indonesia and also for Interfee Day um, um, in the future, I hope. Yeah, so um, thank you so much again for Interfee Day from, from Pam Hasin and, and then um, uh, Busafa. And I really um, appreciate for this, and I hope this will continue. We work together, it's not only between Interfee Day and my institution, which is Nusantara Institute, which is not really focused on Interfee Dialogue, we focus on the study, more on scholarship project, on scientific projects, on study on religion, study on cultures, but also to build connections with the groups in the Middle East. Well, I, I, I really, um, I like to um, maybe to deepen our relationship with with all of us, it's not only from Muslim, but also from Jewish and other centers for Christian and Catholic centers. Again, thank you so much, Bu Elga, Pak Mahasin, and, yeah. and Bak Sapa. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Sumanto Al Kurtubi. You remind me, uh, John Paul Lederer's book is a required book for my uh, class when I was in Chicago. So, uh, especially a book on reconciliation. Okay, thank you again, uh, 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 Professor Sumanto. And now, uh, Pilbert Agagno, could you please give you a closing word? Pilbert Agagno? Uh, yes, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, my first uh, uh, word of closing is to congratulate uh, Interfi Day on the, on the anniversary. And we want to pray that uh, the good work that they are doing, that you're doing may continue and may it be reflected in the minds and in the actions of every other person who is affiliated to the organization. Secondly, is to the young people in this call, to the young people, to the youth uh, within the network, let us work together. One thing that we have on our side is time. This is not to make the elders in our midst feel bad, but it's the reality of the time that uh, one thing that we have on our side is time. How are we going to be remembered when our time is done? 
what legacy are we going to leave that calls us to deliberately make decisions, take decisions, take actions that will leave an imprint, that will leave an impact in the face of this world. Thank you so much to the interview day for inviting me. I am so honored. Thank you so much, Reverend, uh, uh, Reverend Elgar and the rest of the team. May God bless you all and may the work that you continue doing continue to have an impact. Thank you so much, everyone. You're welcome, Pilbert. Thank you, Pilbert. Okay, now uh, Yehuda Stolov. You want to say something for your closing word, Yehuda? Are you still there? Yeah, Mr. Yehuda, tadi pamit duluan. Okay, now uh, Ibu Nelly. Ibu Nelly, you want to say something for closing word? Thank you so much. Um, okay. Thank you. I um, I actually uh, left out the topic of youth <laughs> because I thought then I'll go too far over time. But thank you, Ibu Elga, for bringing that up because working with young people, especially now in this time of uh, a lot of stress and anxiety because of COVID, but not just that, also other things. I see that um, for young people, it is very easy to lose perspective. And um, one of the things that Indifi Day reminds us of and has to continue reminding us of that big pictures matter, big visions matter, but at the same time, the micro level is very important. A big picture like uh, uh, we just heard Professor Kotobi say, uh, quoting Professor Lederach, a, a bridge is never built from the middle. You know, you, in a way you start with tiny things. You get a big idea of a beautiful bridge and then you have to work out the details. And I think that is also something very important to keep in mind because, um, I mean, there are some uh, advantages of being a little older, by the way. <laughs> and one of the things is that you know that nothing is built in a day, that we need time, and that everything has the time. In, in the Bible, it talks about that. There, there's the right time for everything. And I think that we have to continue. And um, first of all, thank you, uh, Ibu Elga. Thank you, Mushafa. Thank you, uh, but Mahasin, uh, thank you all for the, 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 the efforts that you have put in this and that you have never given up and never lost hope and strength. But also thank you all who are present in this call because I know each and every one of you is doing important work where you are. And I think it is very inspiring to see you all uh, in this meeting and to know what you are doing. Thank you all for that. And we pray that God, God may bless this world work, um, work as we go forward in this world, because the interface engagement is one of the, the most important challenges that we are facing in the times ahead of us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ibu Nelly. Maelga, you would like to say something in the closing word? No, Hola. I just, yeah. I just thank you very much for all. And uh, yes, maybe later uh, Rueda will give an announcement for our uh, celebration in August 10. But I let to Rueda. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for all speakers and all participants. Now I will close this session with the word quoting from Harold Casimo and Byron Sherwin. Word and no more self -sufficient no more independent, no more isolated than individual or nation. Horizon are wider, dangers are greater, no region is an island. We are all involved in other spiritual betrayal on the part of one of us affect the faith of all of us. Rumi said, be like a compass. And from the one foot well established center of circle, that is belief and love of God, and travel with your other food, with people of 72 nation, maybe no more than 72, of different races, colors, religion, ideologies, worldviews, cultures, personalities. 
be so tolerant that your heart become white like ocean. Become inspired with faith and love for others, love all creation because of the creator. Offer a hand, because we are just talking about justice, so offer a hand to those in trouble and be concerned about everyone. So long as you remain in yourself, you are a particle. But if you get united with everybody, you are a mind, you are an ocean. All spirit are one and all bodies are one. There are many languages in the world, in meaning all are the same. If you break the cup, water will be unified and will flow together. Thank you. And now I give back the time to the, um, what is that? The announcer. Thank you again. And if I have a, a lot of mistake for my moderator, please accept my apology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Siapa, and also the 10 speakers for shared your experiences and reflections, which are absolutely enriched us in many ways. And now, uh, Frater Professor Dr. Johannes Ohio Timor, Master of Science, member of Intervide Board, will give us a closing remark. Uh, Pastor, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Dian. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Yes. My beloved sisters and brothers in peace, greetings from Manado, Sulawesi, North Sulawesi. I am honored to be entrusted with this closing remark. First of all, on behalf of the Board of Dian Institute Interfide, Yogyakarta, Indonesia, I would like to express our deep gratitude to all participants of the fourth webinar in celebrating the 30th anniversary of our interfaith institution. In a very special way, I would like to thank all distinguished speakers and also master of ceremony and moderator of this webinar. You come from different countries and states in United States, Europe, Africa, and Asia to share with us your stimulating experience and profound reflection, sharing your vision of interfaith dialogue and peace promotion. Your presence in this webinar and your contribution to our talk show convince the Board of Dian Institute Interfide that despite cultural and religious diversities, humankind shares one and only one universal humanity. Your remarkable presentation also confirms that peace is what human hearts everlastingly seek for and that living together socially and politically in harmony and in a peaceful neighborhood is a high achievement of civilization. This fourth webinar that involves the International Interfaith Network strengthens the existence of our Interfaith Institute. It also gives confirmation to our vision and our mission. Thus, after 30 years of its, its existence, with all kinds of programs, activities, challenges, and struggles, the Institute Interfide has to continue to look forward with hope 
of a new future. Now we can convincingly say that the Ian Institute is not and will be never alone in carrying out its mission in Indonesia. Its mission of interfaith dialogue and to be a peace promoter for all is a universal and human in its existence. Our mission is not yet accomplished. My brothers and sisters, after all, an old question reappears. If all religions teach peace, why cannot all religion achieve peace? The essence of religion is double-sided. On the one hand, religion has its external aspect or manifestation, such as organization, community life, leadership, scriptures, doctrines, moral rules, and more import importantly, how religions contribute to the common good or for the public welfare of society. In this webinar, all speakers have shared their experience and reflection upon this aspect. On the one hand, religion guide personal journey into the deepest corner of one's heart, where the religious individual encounters the transcendent divine being. A philosopher, Alfred North Whitehead, wrote in his book, Religion in the Making, I quote, religion is what the individual does in his own solitariness. This religion is solitariness. And if you are never solitary, you are never religious. It is in the core of solitariness that a religious individual feels at home with him or herself before God. This is the inner and spiritual experience of peace. This religion and faith bring human person to stand on the divine land peacefully. This sounds mystical, however, this is what all wise religious peoples testify and what all human hearts yearn. Being a peace promoter means guide, guiding human hearts towards the experience of peace. My sister and brother, Finally, this international webinar itself has become a form of interfaith dialogue, solidarity, and joint movement. At least we have experienced that there can be no peace without sincere encounter and genuine dialogue with open-hearted. Encounter and dialogue need compassionate heart that, that unites every person and individuals in one fraternity, one imbrication, if you want. All humans are brothers and sisters. In the words of Pope Francis Fratelli Tutti, we are all Let's look with a quotation from Karen Armstrong. I quote, compassion 
is the key in Islam and Buddhism, in Judaism and Christianity. They are profoundly similar. Thank you very much, my beloved brother and sisters. Thank you, Pastor. And my brothers and sisters, the closing remark is also the sign that we have reached the end of the session tonight. So thank you everyone for your participation since beginning to the end. And now I give back to my friend, Kaida. Kaida, please. Okay, thank you, Kadian. Thank you, uh, Prof. Yong, Prof. Safa, and all the resource person. Thank you so much for uh, yeah, your attend your participation in this uh, room. Thank you so much for all our friends. Yeah, I just give uh, some notes from uh, Miss Elga. Uh, yeah, in uh, on ten of I guess. Yeah, uh, we will celebrate uh, little celebrate in virtually about our thirty anniversary with all friends from. Uh, local uh, network and the teachers, the the intervention, and uh, also some of our friends in uh, Asia Pacific and international. So we hope we can uh, meet on the 10 August. The apa ya? The perayaan gitu ya. Uh, kita little syukuran gitu. Kalau uh, ya. Yeah, uh, Fine. Yeah, celebrate uh, our 30 anniversary. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, uh, it the close this meeting. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, shalom, Om Santi Santi Om, Namo Buddhaya, Rahayu, Salam Kebajikan. Thank you and sorry for all the mistaken we made. Thank you so much for our teacher. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Terima kasih. Thank you, Nick. Thank you so much. Ya. Yeah. Okay, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Su. Thank you. Thank you. Terima kasih. Terima kasih, Bu Elga. Halo, terima kasih ya. Ya. Halo, ini dari Aceh nih. Terima kasih, Ibu. Terima kasih, Bu Elga. Ya, terima kasih ya. Okay. Dari Madiun, Masih, dari Prof. Aceh. Nuan, thank you. Ini dari Yangun <laughs> ada ini dari. Thank you Bu Nelly kalau masih ada. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much.